All right. Billy, can you unmute, unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear awesome. you now. Hey, we're here. Okay. We're and we're here. broadcasting. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, hi, everybody. It's uh, 6 o'clock standard time in the United States on a Wednesday, so that means it's learning space time. And I'm um, <laughs> glad everybody could join us today. My name is Georgia Bracey. I am uh, CosmoQuest formal education lead um, and former teacher, and so uh, this is just all kinds of fun stuff for me. And this week, um, I am here with Lily Bui, who manages, I believe, all the good stuff over at SciStarter.com. And Lily, you can tell us a little bit about yourself in just a second. But before we get started, um, you may have noticed somebody's missing, at least at the moment. Nicole Gallucci, who is usually uh, behind the wheel here, is just um, off a plane and in a taxi and going to a hotel somewhere for a conference. She's going to um, join us as soon as she can. So we'll be looking forward to her jumping in here pretty soon. Um, so for a couple other logistics, if you would like to um, ask us questions and comment on things tonight, we really hope that you will. Um, please use the Q&A app. I am going to try to uh, monitor questions and comments there. Um, so please go ahead and do that. Um, say hello. Oh, hooray. Adley, I I'm, hope I'm saying that right. Nancy, all right, we've got a couple of people out there saying hello. So please do that with the Q&A app. Um, you can also post comments on the event page, and I will try to keep track of them there too. So um, I'm not usually doing all this behind-the-scenes stuff, so I apologize in advance if um, I miss somebody's comments. Um, if I seem to have missed it, just please throw another one out there. Um, but we'll have a good time tonight. So, Lily, um, let's get started then with you. Um, this is going to be citizen science in the classroom, and SciStarter is all about citizen science projects. Um, but why don't we start with you and your background and kind of how you got to where you are at SciStarter. Sure. Yeah, I just um, I wanted to... Um, Adjust something in the introduction. I actually can't claim to run everything in SciStar. I mean, we have a team, and uh, the founder is Darlene Cavalier, and she's not here today, obviously. But I'm the executive editor, and uh, so I help coordinate the content. And education is definitely uh, one of the big pushes that we're trying to do. Um, we realize that part of our audience is teachers, and whenever we post something about citizen science, um, we notice that a lot of teachers get excited about the projects that we're promoting, but they may not necessarily know how to use the projects in the classroom, and that's one of the biggest challenges that we're tackling. Okay. Um, and so today I'm going to tell you about our educators page, which is a resource that we've put together on our site. And um, if you're looking at the chat box, then you might be able to see the link. It's the first one that I've sent out. It's SciStarter.com slash page slash educators.html, which will get shorter um, if that <laughs> site grows, um, so that's easier to access. But okay. if you're looking at the site... Yeah, so SciStarter.com, right, and again, I'm going to try to post some links, but yeah. um, that, at least, easy to get to, SciStarter.com, so you can start there. Awesome. And then... Myself so I can yeah. be looking at it as well. Yeah, uh, so this page is an aggregation of a lot of resources that exist for citizen science and educators. Um, and so I want to disclaim, first of all, that we are not education experts, but we do actively look for ways to aggregate resources and model best practices and connect them to related projects so that more teachers can engage their students in projects based on their preferences. Um, and first and foremost, the heart of our site is our project finder. And if you go to the home page, you'll see a little search box on SciStarter.com, and it enables you to search for different kinds of projects based on topics or location or keywords or um, your, you know, your preferences. And you can cater that search however you want, and there are different filters that you can use. And as of right now, I think we have a little bit over 700 projects that you can search from. And we're, we're trying to improve the database so that it's even more searchable, and it will potentially serve up more projects based on um, things that you've searched for in the past or have been looking at. Um, so oh, yeah. that's one of the things that we're on, um, Yeah, can you search on like grade level or... Um, 
and eventually that will be my yeah, eventually we hope to build that in there um, yeah. and I'll get into it a little bit more later but sure. um, making sure that we properly tag projects based on teaching standards is also part of the plan um, and that's something that I hope to get into a little bit later in the discussion um, so the the finder is kind of the heart of our site and it unites everything that we do and we started to notice like I mentioned that a lot of the projects that we promote were well received by educators and we do have a partnership with NSTA the National Science Teachers Association where we cross post content and they serve our projects up to not our projects but the projects we feature on our site up to an audience of teachers um, and so we get the word out that way as well um, okay, and yeah, I was going to say, I wonder how most teachers find their way to your site, so NSTA right. probably is a biggie, because that's a huge organization mm -hmm. uh, in the United States anyway for teachers. Right, exactly. Uh, so we get some of our projects promoted through that venue, mm -hmm. um, and then we also have other project uh, partnerships with uh, PLOS. We have a citizen science blog on their site, and we recently started a pilot program on WHYY in Philadelphia, and that's a, an NPR affiliate station. They are doing a bi-monthly, uh, I always forget, is it bi-monthly? That means twice a month. They, they do a segment strictly <laughs> yeah, on I forget that too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned PLOS oh, just a second ago, and I just right. want to say, so Public Library of Science, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Very good. And that's... That website is just plus, P -L -O -S org, but that's a great site as well. Yes, and let me actually great. find the link to our blog on PLOS because that has a slightly different URL. I'm going to put this in the chat box so you can see it, Georgia, and if you want to send it out, then you can. Yeah, like I say, if I don't get these links posted live here, I will certainly post them once we're all finished. Sure, yeah. One way or another, they'll get out there. But PLOS <laughs> is a great, a great site. Um, right. Organization of scientists um, trying to make uh, all the literature, that good scientific literature out there, freely accessible to everybody. So that's yeah. Uh, so let me bring it back to the educators page. Sure. Okay. And so if you're looking at the page, you will see some brief introductory material. It will mention our partnership with NSTA, um, and it will link you to some other pages on our site that explains exactly what citizen science is and how it can benefit both participants and researchers. It'll link you to our finder and it'll link you to uh, some other resources about teaching standards and the projects themselves. And if you scroll down, you'll see that we've handpicked some projects from our database and segmented them based on grade level. In the first part, you'll see elementary school projects and then we also have middle school projects, high school and college. And we've tried to align these with the same kind of segmentations as NSTA uses so that, you know, if you're an educator that's used to seeing things packaged in the way that NSTA does and you come over to our site, then it'll seem somewhat familiar. and It'll make it more navigable. Okay, great, great. All right, because NSTA also spans the, um, <laughs> the grade levels from early on up into um, higher education. So it's all there. Right. Um, and one of the great things that we've been able to do is uh, we've connected with a curriculum developer, a science educator and curriculum developer, who's done work for Smithsonian and also now uh, works for the Smithsonian Science Education Center. And she is making a blog series that aligns our projects to Common Core and Next Generation Standards. And so if you look at the educators page and scroll down to any project that has that dash teaching standards met in red, okay. uh, for example, let's just go to Project NOAA. I'm going to use that as an example. Ellie, could you give that URL one more time for the educators page? Sure. Let me send you this link. Here it is. Did you get that? All right. Um, got it. Okay. SciStarter.com forward slash page forward slash ed. Oops, sorry. Educators.html. All right. Let's see if I can get that. Awesome. Oops. And I'm going to. Okay. And I'm just about to refer to this link right here, which is a blog post. Okay.
So the link I, ju I just sent out is um, a blog post about Project NOAA, which is a nature-related citizen science project. Um, and this is just an example of one of the posts in the series about how the teaching standards align to projects in our database. And it's broken down in a way that caters specifically to educators. So if you're looking at this blog post and you happen to know a little bit about Project NOAA and want to get involved somehow, she breaks it down by what grades they are appropriate for. For instance, this one is for K through 12. A brief description of the, the project itself and some images that have to do with the website, things that might be helpful. And she also lists materials that you might need in order to participate. For example, Project NOAA, you might need a computer with internet access, and a digital camera would be helpful, a pencil or pen, notebooks, <laughs> um, okay. just all the little things that you might want to know before you even think about incorporating this into your classroom. And then uh, below that, she lists why the Citizen Science Project is a strong candidate for the classroom and some she lists some key reasons why this could be helpful um, and why it could be a really engaging activity for your students to, to get involved in. Okay. And then, very importantly, she, uh, she lists any teaching materials that come appended to the project itself. And some projects do provide that, others don't, um, mm -hmm. and she usually will list that here. And then there's also some information about online safety for children. Uh, project NOAA is a nature observation kind of project, so you'll be submitting data, and she, you know, for the educator's knowledge, will list some information about what it means to involve your students and, you know, what kind of privacy policies are involved there. Okay, and, and that's then, really nice because that's right. something that we often don't think about. Um, mm -hmm. And I know probably many teachers don't think about um, when they're thinking of putting technology in their classroom and letting their students and encouraging their students to go out on the internet. So, and that's something, you know, kids don't think about it at all. So you do have to sort of um, be very purposeful about talking to that, to the kids about that. So absolutely uh, to be safe out there. So that's a very nice, very nice feature for this. So this is really um, great, very comprehensive. All the things I would think that teachers would want to know when they're considering citizen science for their class. Right, awesome. yeah. And uh, she saves the best for last. And the very end of every post will list all of the different Common Core and Next Gen standards that the projects align to. She'll break it down by grade, and she'll even, um, you know, uh, I know that there are tons of visualizations of all these standards and, you know, how they fit into everything, but she'll usually include the little code that it's attached to and then a brief description of what that standard <laughs> means. Okay. Um, and so that's there as a resource for, for teachers and educators. Very good. So when you're making those lesson plans and you need to know which standards you're addressing, <laughs> they're all here. And exactly. there's quite a lot of them, which is really, which is great. Actually, citizen science, I think, is is perfect for addressing so many different standards, and we can talk more about that in a little bit. But great to have them all here. So at least again for the United States, we have many sets of standards, and it kind of depends on your your local school district and your state as to which ones maybe are taking priority or that you've actually adopted. So, um, but everything you need is here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to get into a conversation about the standards, actually, because there, there are some questions that we're exploring and, you know, I'd love some feedback on from an audience of educators. But before that, I was wondering if anyone had any questions about what they've seen so far. Yeah, let me see. So we've got lots of nice hellos. We've got Guido, hello. Um, <laughs> yeah, Nancy. I hope, Nancy, I hope we got you to the educators page. <laughs> she was asking about the URL again. <laughs> Um, oh, let's see. Oh, let's see. She earlier got a page not found error, so I hope that's hope that's been resolved. Maybe that was a typo. Um, so no, seen any questions yet, but plenty of hellos. So maybe awesome. we can just um, talk a little more about you know about some of the different standards and. Um, as you guys put this on your site, um, are you trying to capture, you know, all the standards that are out there? Uh, do you tend to lean towards one set versus another or um, find that some, you know, are more applicable in a way to citizen science projects? You know, that's a good question and that's something that we're still trying to learn more about ourselves. 
our series kind of like we kind of default to the curriculum developer. Like she uh -huh. uses Common Core and Next Gen, but okay. we're also aware that not every school, not every state uses Next Gen standards. So that's something else that we're trying to uh, take into account as we do this. Um, and in terms of organizing all these different kinds of standards, it would be great to hear from an audience of educators um, what the best way to organize them would be. You know, if you were a teacher and you came to our site and you were looking for a project, what matters most to you? What would you be looking for first? Like, what's step A, what's step B, what's step C? And at what point do those standards and how specific they are come into play? Um, so that's something that we're kind of trying to learn how to do better. Um, there was a conference in Oklahoma recently and it just so happened that one of the speakers, uh, Tim LeBock, who is an assistant professor of science education at the University of Oklahoma, did a presentation about uh, just this, about aligning citizen science projects to, um, I think it's called the eight scientific practices of the, the next gen standards. Sure, right, so the next generation, yeah, we say next gens now or NGSS, the next generation right. science standards have three basic domains that they cover and one is science and engineering practices, right, and so there's eight right. different science and engineering practices and they mostly overlap, um, they just differ on a couple of points, so they're usually kind of lumped together, but Right, so there's those eight practices that um, get a lot of attention, and I would think especially with citizen science, because citizen science is a very practice-based activity. You're actually doing things. So. Right, and so he, he thought it might be a good idea to kind of uh, lump the, the projects into those eight, or lump the standards into those eight categories and then kind of organize the projects underneath those. Um, and he's, I'm hoping to get him to do a guest blog post for um, our site so that he can kind of run through what he talked about during his session. Um, and so in terms of the standards for the blog series, we're currently using Common Core Next Gen. And um, we're hoping that our site eventually can be a place where students and teachers can come to, or students can come to demonstrate their uh, understanding of the Common Core standards. Potentially, it could mean that on our site, students can come and kind of report on what they've done, or teachers can keep track of their students' activities. Like, you know, hey, I observed um, this many birds for the Great Backyard Bird Count, and this is what I saw, this is what I did. And uh, our understanding, we're not, um, again, we're not experts on education standards, but we're hoping to kind of fill that gap where, you know, teachers might want their students to get involved and then be able to report on that and demonstrate their understanding of what they just did. Sure, and that's a big part um, of assessment too, as, as things get more performance-based, which is actually another aspect of the next-gen science standards. Um, but that's been around for a while, um, to get your students to actually demonstrate in a practical way, in a meaningful way, um, what they have learned and what they have done. Um, so that idea of a place where they can show that um, and maybe share what they have learned and what they've been doing is a great idea because that in itself could be a teacher's assessment. Um, that could be something that shows to the teacher that yes, the student went out and participated and observed you know, birds, like you say, or um, something else and then came and, and talked about it. So that's really a fantastic idea. Right, um, and in tackling this whole um, this whole issue of the standards, uh, we realize that it's going to require a lot of man and woman power to kind of make sure that our database reflects how specific the standards are. And so, if you happen to be listening and you're a pre-service teacher or interested in joining this conversation, feel free to contact me, um, and we can talk about how you can help with the uh, the effort. Hi, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Look. You made it. <laughs> you must be in a hotel somewhere. <laughs> I, I am in Raleigh, Durham uh, for Science Online, and I just got to the hotel. Oh, so awesome. Sorry to barge in on you guys, but I at least want no, to No, not at all. <laughs> sure. Yeah, just butt right in. Come on. <laughs> Yay. No, glad you could make it, definitely. Um, but, Lily, I wanted, yeah, I noticed that on your, on the educators page, that you guys are looking for um, pre-service teachers especially 
to help um, look at the standards and align the activities that you've got on your site with the standards. And um, I think that's a great idea. And I was just curious, why pre-service teachers in particular? Any any reason? That, and that for, I don't know, that's a term that I hear a lot of, but not everybody. So that would be like um, people who are going to school to learn how to be a teacher. So they're not act right. actually a teacher yet, but they're... Uh, maybe an elementary education major somewhere or a secondary education major. So what right. is it about that group that you, you hope to get? That actually came as a suggestion from uh, Timothy Labock. He said that that okay. might be a good group to reach out to because um, if you're a pre-service teacher and you're looking for some kind of experience in curriculum development, then this might be an opportunity to get your feet wet. Um, and so we're hoping to kind of hit two birds with one stone. Like, one, we're improving our database, but two, we're also helping out this emerging group of teachers who are about to enter the force. <laughs> yeah, and they're coming, you know, into the workforce, like you say, just as these new standards are rolling out. Um, the Common Core standards have been around just a little longer than the next gens, but they're pretty new, and the next gens are uh, very new, and not all the states have adopted them yet. Uh, most of them probably will, but we're actually we're not expecting everybody to adopt them. But they're very new, and so people are still trying to figure out, yeah, how to just incorporate them into a lesson plan. You know, which parts of them do you pick for your lesson? Because they're very they're very rich, which is great. There's a lot in them. So you know, which pieces of those do you try to put in your lesson, and what do you try right. to emphasize? So that's really, that's just, it's so new. People are really wrestling with that still. Right. Yeah, and I, if anyone's listening, I'd, I'd love to hear feedback on what you've seen so far because this is something that we put together because we felt there was an audience for it, um, and it can always be improved. So if you have any comments, suggestions, or anything like that after having glanced at it, I... I'm definitely yeah. all ears. And the best way to get information, like you say, or even volunteer to help, it would be back on the educators page, correct? Yes, and I believe there is an email there, and it's probably my email. Um, I, think so I saw that following up there as well. Shoot me a message. <laughs> oh, I also I also wanted to mention a couple other resources that exist. Um, so we have our educators page, but we also like to point people towards other educational resources, and that's listed at the very bottom of the educators page right here. Uh, let's see, let me scroll down. Yep. Um, so CosmoQuest also has a great resource for uh, for educators, the Educator Zone, and we also link to Nova Labs, um, which has a very very content rich educators page. They have, because Nova is a TV show, they also have lots of TV content and videos that they can link to. Um, and they package it together very nicely. Um, they have a few labs that they've put together, which are citizen science projects. And they're based on, um, I think there's a sun lab, a cloud lab, an energy lab, one about DNA or RNA. Um, and they're, are, they're coming out with new ones every few months or so. And um, they also have content from the show itself to enrich whatever they're doing um, on the educational side. Mm -hmm. Project Bud Burst is another really great resource um, and the link is there. Um, it's another nature observation network. Your Wildlife is also another great one as well as Zooniverse's Zoo Teach. Okay, great. So all of these are kind of uh, hubs for citizen science and they also have put together an initiative to get some, some content out neatly packaged for educators and we list those at the bottom of the page. Okay, yep, all down at the bottom of the page. Lots of good resources. Um, yeah. Are there any projects um, that you have a sense that teachers are making their favorite or that are more popular or um, or do you have a sense of that at this point? You know, I haven't heard anything so that's why you know, I'd love to get feedback from anyone who, who's actually gone out and tried this in their classroom. Yeah. And also the other part of it is yeah. that we need to make it more accessible to teach for teachers to tell us, you know, if they've tried it and create a space on our site for that. Um, but I don't know. I I guess the, uh, the Coco Ross project I know has been used in classrooms before. That's the... Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Um, and that is one of, Wow. Yeah, it's a huge acronym. Yeah, but it's a catchy acronym. acronym. Coco Ra. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a great project. Um, it has to do with weather and precipitation. Mm -hmm. Super easy to get involved in. Um, most of it involves uh, either observing something or measuring how much rainfall that you get and reporting that to a website. And it's and even if there's no precipitation, that's also significant and it's good for them to know. Yeah. So uh, it's really easy to do. Okay. Very good. So, Nicole, we've got a couple of people saying hello to you. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I can't see hello. the comments. <laughs> I'm on my iPad. <laughs> my uh, laptop is on the fritz, so I'm traveling with the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. And then um, Nancy has a question. Nancy Fratchian. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. I'm announcing that correctly. You, hello, I'm As Nancy. Yeah, aside from spreading the word via our social media circles, yay, how can non-teachers contribute? So we, we have a call definitely for teachers or pre-service teachers. Um, what about you know other types of citizens, other types of people and groups? That is a great question. Um, right now, it'd be so great to, you know, get feedback on our the, the current content that we've been running. Um, anything on the blog or, you know, like if you look at our home page, any suggestions on how that can be more navigable would be great. Um, uh, yeah, it's see. general usability kind of stuff. Huh? Yeah, exactly. And we've done research about how our site works before and, you know, how people move from page to page. But anything like that, anything that if you look at our site and you say, this doesn't really speak to me, nothing really jumps out at me. Mm -hmm. um, we would want to make it more relatable to you because we want you to get involved. So there are any suggestions that might make it easier for you to navigate around that would be really great to hear from you. Um, let's see. And one thing we, we hear a lot from teachers, and you, I'm sorry if you already covered this, but uh, no, is no. that um, they uh, have very limited time. And so I think ha making it easy to navigate is, is, a, is a big deal for teachers because they don't have much time. Um, and especially if they're revamping their curriculum for new standards, depending on how their you know state or district is handling it, um, have you gotten any feedback along those lines from teachers that it's like, hey, I just need quick, I mean, or are you finding it difficult to to have them find the time to do it? Right, that would be great. I think one of the things that we're trying to incorporate into our database in terms of tagging and segmenting them, segmenting the projects, I mean, is uh, making sure that we communicate very well like how long each project will take. And I think this did exist in some iteration of the database at some point but it's not as consistent as it could be and it's not um, it's it probably doesn't cover all of the projects so far because new ones are being entered all the time. Um, and in terms of making things neatly packaged and accessible, um, the educators page is uh, like an, an initiative to do that and put all the educators materials on one page. But potentially, um, you know, if you were to click on a project there might be a tab that says for teachers or you know discuss what you did in the classroom or something like that some kind of forum where you can see everything all at once um, so that's kind of in our plans for how the site will evolve okay okay good well there's definitely tons of great information and I gotta agree with Nicole it's usually all about time, you know, <laughs> time yeah. and timing. Sometimes, you know, it's do I have the time, and then other times, you know, is it the right time of year, you know, am I, do I have yeah. a break from testing, or is the weather the right, you know, depending on the Citizen Science Project, too, if it's an outdoors one, you know, what's the season, and is it the right Absolutely. time Absolutely. that, so um, all those scheduling things and just having time. Uh, yeah. Both prepare and to actually fit it into your class, your day. Uh, right. School. So that mm -hmm. is really critical for teachers. Another great way to keep in keep yourselves in the loop about projects that we feature is to sign up for the newsletter. And you mentioned seasons, um, and that that uh, I it's the end of the day. I can't even think of my idioms right now. But <laughs> no <laughs> I like problem. that. Triggered I thought. End of the day. Yeah, it reminded me <laughs> of the fact that our newsletters are often thematic and sometimes they're based yeah. on season. Okay. So here are five projects you can do in the fall. Here are five mm -hmm. projects that are perfect for spring. Um, and so that might also be a good way to keep in touch about what projects might be good per season in the classroom. Okay, great. And how? What's the easiest way to sign up for the newsletter? I, I think it's just on the home page. There should just be on a the home page. Great. Yep. Okay. Sure. .com. There should be a, a field where you enter. Windows. Okay. Yep. 
good. Music right in the center. Yeah. There's so many great outdoor type um, citizen science projects, which you know, when the weather and everything fits, is is wonderful, and it gets the kids outside and all that. And then there's, you know, the projects that are more um, computer based and. You know, you don't need to go outside, and that fits too. You know, I think the the cool thing about citizen science projects, there's so many of them, and there's just one definitely that's going to fit either, you know, your grade level of kids, um, your interest in a topic, or you know, the environment that you have, whether or not you can go outside, or what kind of computer and internet access you have. Mm -hmm. um, the variety is just amazing. So. You know, that's a bonus for teachers, too, because there's such a big variety in, you know, resources and types of schools that are out there and types of students. So, you know, there's something that you can find here that will fit. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and so in terms of projects you can do outside, um, this, I'm thinking of this winter. We've been getting so much snow mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. All this polar vortex stuff. Um, yeah, one of my favorite projects. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, it's so so easy to get involved in is <laughs> snow tweets, where you basically go outside and you stick a ruler in the snow, or in some cases you might not even need to if you're not getting as much snowfall. Um, you can basically draft a tweet on Twitter and add your zip code or your latitude and longitude if your phone allows you to do that, and just tweet it out, and the project. Uh, organiz the organization that's putting the project together will scrape Twitter data and pull all those data points from all over the globe, whoever's tweeting, and use it to study the cryosphere. Nice. So, that's awesome. Yeah. I, my friends make fun of me for going outside with a ruler every time. <laughs> I think it's so much fun. <laughs> you can just tell them now that everyone's doing it. All the citizens are doing it. It's yeah. science, guys. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go out with a ruler and your phone, and then you. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, it's me. That tweet Why am I not with my phone? <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah, and then cool. there's another one that might be fun for students. Um, iWire is out of. Mm. Um, it's a it's yeah. a project that's out of MIT, and they're um, basically it's a game that you can play to map eye neurons, and so the gamification aspect of it makes it fun and more engaging, and it might be a little bit more attractive to younger kids. Instead of being told that they're doing science and it's an assignment, it's something that's fun and they can get involved in it. It's kind of a lean-in experience as opposed to a lean-back one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, iWire does some amazing stuff. Um, right. I've seen them talk at a couple different conferences now, showing they even had a, they had a live session with some of their some of their really hardcore, I guess, gamers. <laughs> you can call them gamers. Mm -hmm. You can call them scientists. They're both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just logs hours and hours uh, to get points. It's it's a really impressive project right. they have going. It's really pretty. I, I've only looked at it a couple times and I, I'm like, wow, that's complicated. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not that like once you sit down and get into it, it's really cool. Right. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Graciano says she loves the snow. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> can't tell if she's serious or not. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I love the snow for a little bit, but you know it's fun if you go out and then yeah, you have a purpose. You go out and measure exactly snow, measure rain. It's so simple. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's another project where just going off to you know be part of a, a larger study. Right, and that's one of the projects also where you know even if you're not getting any snow, <laughs> submitting a data point is also helpful. Yeah, zero. Yep, <laughs> teaching teaching students the importance of publishing. No, <laughs> no result. It is. Oh, yeah, it's exactly. Too. <laughs> That's really important because they, you know, people, the students, they think, you know, I did something wrong. I'm not getting a result, yeah. or I'm not mm -hmm. getting the result I think I should get. And but you know, whatever you result you're getting, that's what it is. That's your that's your yeah. data, and right, you know, exactly. you own it and be proud of it. And it's and it kind of it highlights the process rather than the result. Right. Yeah. Right. The process of doing that you're learning from, and not the outcome. Yeah. Are you guys getting data on um, how popular are those outdoor hands-on projects compared to something that's on a computer, compared to, I don't know, something that um, just your computer runs on when you're not there? That Do you guys a have an idea question. of the relative popularity? That's a great question. I'm actually going to make a note of that. I don't have any information about you know, uh, outdoor projects versus indoor projects, but that's a good question okay. to look into as we improve the way we um, look at our numbers on the back end. 
Yeah, if you yeah. so anyone who's listening, if you have questions like that, send them over to me too, because that'll help us grow and um, help yeah, us. Yeah, these are research questions. Exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was just George. I was just reading that paper we got on that other list uh, about um, citizen science uh, dabblers, and they they actually yes. did a study of people who of uh, a particular online citizen science project did you know, little bits here and here and there, and they got some really interesting results on, you know, even though there may be a lot of people that sign up, not all of them stick with it, all the accumulated results of all those dabblers really matters to the project. Um, and yeah, yeah. And some of the motivations of that, too, which is cool. Yeah, and it's interesting because you would think sort of, um, I don't know, might make sense that you'd want your participants in a citizen science project to, you know, be those long-term people. You know, you want to get somebody and you want to keep them in your project and make them happy and make them feel like they're part of the community and, and they're giving you good data and all that. But, yeah, like Nicole said, you know, this paper is suggesting that, well, that would be great, but, you know, you've got all these other people that are just kind of coming, trying it out, and for whatever reason they don't stick around, but still, if you've got enough of those guys, right. you're still right. getting good data, and, and it's very useful. And they so, mentioned certain effects about like how to, Yeah, work with those right. kinds of people, too. Nicole, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I actually just got back from the Citizen Cyber Science Summit in London. Oh, excellent. And um, have you heard of Crowdcrafting? They're another platform for Citizen no, Science. No, I haven't. So they're, you should check them out. Um, they're completely open in the sense that you do not need to create a login in order mm-hmm. to participate or submit data points. So their mm-hmm. audience basically is... They are the dabblers. Um, yeah. so you come in, you participate in what you're interested in, you help answer the research questions that engage you, and then you leave. And then you can come back if you want, or you don't have to come back at all. It's more about the research question that's being answered and using the you know your reach into the public in order to answer that question. And then on the other end, uh, SciStarter's trying to think of better ways to help those dabblers manage their projects. So, for example, if you're someone who really likes different kinds of nature projects and you are uh, a participant in Project NOAA and then you also do something for Project Budverse and you also do something for another one and another one, you know, um, we're finding, uh, we found through some informal user survey that we did that people are independently tracking these projects on their own. Either they're keeping track of their emails or, you know, they're blogging it somewhere. Um, And so it's very manual at the moment. And okay, so we're okay. trying to think of better ways to help people manage their projects online and possibly through a dashboard that we put on our site where you can kind of favorite things and you know put them in one place where you can see what you've done so far. Well, that's great. And that's great from a teacher standpoint too because then they can check in on what their students are doing and assign credit or extra credit or whatever they're doing. Exactly. For mm-hmm. multiple projects. Yeah. That's really cool. You have that's, a diverse yeah, citizen that's for science that portfolio. Like a variety. <laughs> yeah, diverse citizen science portfolio. Right. Yeah, there's so many. Look, I want to try them all. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, um, hold on, back to the snow discussion. Let's see. Nancy Graziano <laughs> says that, yes, she's serious. She loves snow. <laughs> and she has tundra blood. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I also have, let me see if I can. Getting good comments tonight. Um, is Jeff- the Q&A and- app great? <laughs> How the comments jump around? <laughs> it does. Now Georgia gets move. to deal with what I have to deal with every week. <laughs> I know. I appreciate you, Nicole. Never fear. I love you, Georgia. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but this is what, so another um, another project suggested by Jeff Richardson. Um, he says the M little M ping. I love capital P-I-N-G app, is another weather-related citizen science project where anyone can participate, and it's become quite possible. So I hope I posted the URL for that on the event page, but it's um, nssl.noaa, N-O-A-A, dot gov, forward slash projects, forward slash ping, um, M-ping. I'm sure you could just Google it. Um... Meteorological phenomena identification near the ground. Awesome. So All these great reporting. Things. So that's another interesting weather one. There's lots of good weather projects. Yeah. So I think it's it actually there. in our finder. I'm just looking through. Oh, yeah. See if it's we, have that, we have that in our database. So that's awesome. It's good to know. Nice. 
Nice. So there's another one for standards weather people. Do, did you guys already talk about standards? What different standards things might hit? We did a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I we did that. a little bit. But um, we mentioned, you know, the next generation science standards and their three domains. And so um, one of the domains is the content areas. And <laughs> Nicole's out. She's back in. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> so obviously all of these projects um, target different content areas, whether it be right. weather, meteorology, um, space, um, birds, whatever it is. So there's the content piece. Um, and then there's these eight scientific and engineering practices, which really is where I think citizen science kind of shines. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's the, you know, it's it's the collecting of data, um, making sense of your data, arguing from reason, um, observing, you know, all of those things and being very systematic about it. Um, and then Lily, as you mentioned, you know, giving opportunity also to share your your data and share what you're doing is another good um, scientific practice. Um, and the other, um, the third domain is cross-cutting concepts. And that is things that um, are more general and could go across any kind of project, any kind of domain. So things like um, noticing patterns or looking for like cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And I think actually citizen science is fantastic with that kind of thing too. Especially, you know, patterns is a big one. Because um, you're out, you're watching, you're observing, you're noticing things, and patterns is a big part of that. Right, exactly. So the new, yeah, the new standards really are, are just made, I think, for citizen science. So we just have to sort of grapple with them and get them down into a manageable. Yeah, that's good to know. That's very reaffirming for us too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's true that the NGSS does um, focus on the process of science, which is something that that citizen science can hit. Uh, has there been any uh, talk or focus on standards outside the U.S.? I know Project 2061 is still in consideration. Is that? No, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I don't know what the standards are in the EU. Ah! <laughs> how does it bring any to, to things besides NGSS? Yeah, I and I, you know, I'm not really familiar with the standards outside the U.S. either. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I think right now we're mostly we're mostly trying to focus. So, on yeah, the US. okay, to focus okay. There, but um, you know, but a lot of it's a one line at a time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely. Uh, so I have another question from Nancy here. She says, as part of your learning plans. Um, do you include a failure mode and effects mm. analysis lesson plan that would cover why students may not see the results they expected or for that matter, like we said, no results at all, um, which is probably a great idea. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've seen anything like that, Lily. That'd be something to consider. Um, we don't have anything like that right now. As I said, we're still trying to build um, our resources for teachers. But mm -hmm. I mean, Georgia, just like you mentioned, like I think the process of participating in some of these projects will show you that not coming up with results right away or at all is totally fine. It's the act of participating that really is the focus. Yeah, and these projects, you know, this is all about doing real science. So I think. Um, where, you know, the idea that you have to have a certain answer, you know, unfortunately gets going is where you have these sort of cookbook type labs and things where it's very structured and, you know, there's many good, you know, activities like that, but you are sort of set on a path to getting, you know, a particular answer. And the students know that. And often, you know, you're graded even on whether or not you get, you know, close at least to this correct answer. And so it gets into your brain that, you know, there's an answer, there's one answer, and I have to get it. And if I don't get it, you know, then, whoa, you know, disaster, something's wrong. And um, like Nancy said, you know, there's a lot to be learned from almost having this, you know, failure mode. What, you know, do we do with results that are different? Um, right. Does it mean that it was a failure? Well, no. It's you know it's an opportunity for learning certainly, but right. that's how science is. You know, real science. So again, another great thing about these projects. Yeah, and beyond that, even um, beyond showing that not coming up with anything is fine, and that you know uh, maybe your result is different, that's totally okay. Um, beyond that, it kind of 
engages students in a way that shows them that science can be fun, hopefully. <laughs> and that's the other element of citizen science that I really love. Um, in most cases, the projects will be based on a research question that comes from some kind of academic institution and or some other larger organization. And you're not in, you're not beholden to solving the mystery, so to speak. You are participating in the process of that question being answered. For example, um, SciStarter partnered with UC Davis and NASA to do a project called Project Mercury. And this was to study microbe growth rates on Earth versus in close to zero gravity environments. And so the process was that um, they crowdsourced a bunch of microbe samples from people's shoes and people's cell phones. So it's just a cotton swab and then you put it in a plastic bag and then you send it to some research centers. Um, and they get analyzed. One of them, one of the samples will be added to a human microbiome map and then the other one will be cultured in a lab and studied and then some select samples will be sent to the International Space Station. And so there's this bigger picture that's happening. And uh, on the grassroots level, on the educational level, kids are just having fun swabbing their phones, swabbing their shoes, and learning that this is contributing to something bigger. Um, and it can be fun. There were also, as part of this project, there were also little um, microbe playing cards. Uh, so each card had a different microbe on it, and like these were fun giveaways for kids who participated. There were also little badges that they gave away for participating. So. Uh, that's just an example of how citizen science can really engage kids and you know let them have fun while participating in science and that's some those two things fun and science really you know aren't things that kids put together mm -hmm. most of the time mm -hmm. um, and so engaging in these types of projects can probably hopefully you know shift the way that kids think about science yeah that's great L Lily do you have a favorite type of citizen science project or one that you've participated in that you really love um, I'm kind of a nerd, so I like all projects, but the ones that I have participated in have been really fun because it, they allow you to go outside and like do something fun. Um, there's something called World Water Monitoring Day, and um, they they sell these kits. I think they're seventeen dollars each, but there's a different rate for teachers if you were to buy a bunch of kits. And they come with pH tablets and um, different tests for turbidity and all these little cool like sampling things. And you can, I think, oxygen content in water was one of them too. Um, but you go to your local stream or river or lake or waterbed, watershed, and then you take a sample of water and you run all these tests on them and the water changes color based on what tests you run. Um, and that's really fun too because it teaches you a little bit about chemistry and it's just a um, really cool environmental science project. Okay, awesome. And you learn something about your local environment too. I think exactly. That's really important with a lot of these outdoor ones is you learn something about where you are and that's why it's good to have the distributed citizen science right. network. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Cool. All right, we're going to the Mississippi River to do that one, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting a couple of trips planned here. We really are. Um, <laughs> and that's actually, you know, there's, I was going to ask you at the beginning, Lily, and then we got off on something else, you know, if you sort of had a definition of citizen science. Because um, that's kind of, you know, it's, it's tossed around a little bit. I think, you know, there's probably one that most people use, but I don't know you know, if there's an official one. And what made me think of it is um, when you talk about your local environment and people getting involved, you know, sometimes citizen science is, you know, citizen as, you know, I'm a citizen of, you know, this city and these are problems and issues that are important to me just because this is where I live and this is the kind of um, landscape um, and features that I have here and problems here. So just, right. you know, being a good citizen that way and being involved Exactly. Um, and in science is sort of one kind of aspect of citizen science, I think. Um, I don't know, Lily, do you have any, you know, what do you carry around in your head as your definition of citizen science? Oh, man. Um, so I'm actually referring back to this page that I helped put together about okay. what citizen science is that exists on SciStarter. And so it's really hard to whittle down to a few words. Um, but if you were Tell to ask or less. Come on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is a long format show. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you're asking someone who thinks about this stuff all day to kind of fine tune it mm -hmm. into like a few words. But to me, it, it's 
science that you can do together, and that's what we have in our site. It, it's science that the public can participate in. It's uh, non-professional, so you do not need a formal degree in science to do this, um, and it's engaging. And you start with a question or you help answer a question, and that's really what it is. And I think bringing that into the classroom ultimately is really valuable. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. Okay, let's see. I have actually a few more. I should go through these questions again. <laughs> um, Nancy adds, let's see. Always having an answer is the unintended result of focusing on standardized tests as opposed to learning how to learn. I can definitely get behind that comment. Um, <laughs> and too much focus on testing and needing that one particular answer. Um, Great comments and questions from Nancy tonight. I know. Hey, we love Nancy. I know, and I know. I'm sorry. I know I've missed a few here. Let's see. <laughs> Go through real quick. Guido says, oh, back to the snow again. At least you folks do have snow. We've been snowless this winter here in Midwest Germany. Boo-hoo. Oh, yeah. no I don't but see we know, that's problem. okay. <laughs> Boo-hoo. No data. No data, really. Boo-hoo, Guido. Boo-hoo. <laughs> I you know. could have We're hours. kind of tired of winter here. I you could have hours. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And then Adley wants to know, um, Lily, you mentioned, was it crab crafting? What did you mention a while it's, ago? It's Sorry. crowd crafting. Crowd, crowd crafting. crafting. Do you have a link for that? Ooh, something you can we can write this on my taxi receipt. Crowd <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have handy. Very good. Right. right here. And you know what? All these links will, if you're putting them on the event page, I'm sure Richard Drum will scoop them up and include them in the show notes okay. when he turns into a podcast. Excellent. I've put a couple there, but um, yeah. yeah, I'm not he, as efficient as you He scoops them up and puts them in the podcast notes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I do it after the show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Very good. And Lily, um, tell us a little more about how you got interested in science. I you so you're a nerd, right? So I am. I actually do not have a science degree. How did um, that happen? International relations in Spanish. Um, oh, so I'm kind of like a political science and linguistics nerd. But I had always harvested an interest in science ever since I was really young. My dad's an engineer. He used to take us to all these engineering festivals when um, I was little. And I, I was really into building things when I was younger, but then, you know, when you're little, you kind of flip-flop back and forth between, like, one day it's, I want to be an astronaut, and the next day it's, like, I want to be a linguist, or at least for me it was. <laughs> and um, I still so want to be an astronaut. I, I ended up choosing the other route um, and indulging in the humanities side of my brain. Um, and then eventually I kind of realized that I didn't want to let go fully of science yet, but it just seemed a little bit too... I, I felt like there was a little bit too much distance between me and the academy. I wasn't going to go back to school and kind of start over with that. But citizen science kind of enables people like me to still be involved and, you know, pursue those questions without um, starting all over and getting some kind of advanced degree. So I, I stay connected to that little girl in me was building uh, bottle rockets <laughs> by participating in this world. And it Excellent. really is wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. Sometimes I think <laughs> I'm still flip-flopping around with what I want to do. Oh, yeah, it never stops. But I think <laughs> I the great other thing, stop. Yeah. the other great thing about citizen science is that it harvests this culture of curiosity, and I'm all for that. It's about the questions, and it's about staying curious about the world around you. And, you know, that's in citizen science with the diversity of projects out there allows you to dabble in a lot of different subject areas and look at what other people are curious about, too. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's see. We're getting close to an hour. Um, Nicole, are you ready to do your fantastic end of show? Oh, you want me to do the wrap-up? Sure. Okay. That's, your, <laughs> that's, your, that's all you. Cause, I got much spiel. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah, let me... <laughs> <laughs> Today is Wednesday, which means Friday is the weekly space hangout at noon Pacific. Uh, Fraser Kane rounds up a bunch of astronomy journalists and aficionados to talk about uh, the week's top news in astronomy and space. That'll be Friday at noon Pacific. Uh, I will not be joining because I'm here at Science Online. Uh, so uh, you can just follow the Twitter. I'm so hashtag. jealous. It's, I'm so excited. <laughs> it was last year. Was, two years ago, I love it. 
Um, yeah, so follow the hashtag uh, SIO14, that's S-C-I-O-1-4, uh, for all the conference goodness as it's happening. Um, so there's that. Virtual Star Party Sunday night, since Scott will be here, I don't, I guess they're having, oh. yeah, I guess Fraser's probably hosting it uh, on his lonesome on Sunday night at 6.30 Pacific, I think they're still doing it. Um, look through the telescopes of our fabulous astronomers from around the world. Uh, Monday, is, uh, as long as neither Pamela or Fraser are traveling, Monday at noon is Astronomy Cast, which brings us back around uh, to Learning Space next Wednesday. And awesome. I don't remember who we have. I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me. <laughs> we have Surprise. 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 I'll create the event tonight, oh. probably. <laughs> Excellent job. Oh, you do that so well. Amazing. Actually, there's something that was kind of astronomy related and we're mm. featuring this week and next, um, Globe at Night yeah, is yes, doing yeah, a campaign that. up until the end of February, and it's a campaign to track light pollution, and it's also very classroom friendly. It's not one of the ones that we featured on our blog for our educators, but it mm -hmm. is very easy to participate in. Mm -hmm. There are multiple ways that you can participate, and one of them is um, downloading an app called The Loss of Night or something. Loss, of, loss of, of the Night. night. It's loss, kind of of the night. loss of the Night. Right. Yeah. Right? And then loss the other of the one night. is. Yeah. Dark sky meter, and you can use those to measure light pollution. So yes, that's Blue right. Night is doing a big, uh, big push for that up until the end of this week. And this so is the first year they're using the classroom. Yeah, and this is the first year they're doing um, a Globe at Night campaign every month. So if you miss this month's next month yeah. around the new moon, there'll be another campaign, and you can give your you can use mobile devices or you can hand your students a star chart and have them compare to the yeah. constellation that they see. Uh, and, and have them log that date on the website. Okay. Yes, we love Globe at Night. We love. I know. I was going to say that's one of my favorites. I, I really <laughs> love. I just I love because dark skies really important. Really important. Yeah. Good. Oh, Tom Nathy says the virtual star party is at 7 p.m. Thank you, Tom. They've moved Pacific it to 7 p.m. Pacific. Thank you. I knew they were moving it soon. I wasn't sure when. Last few. Nancy yeah. at 54. I still want to be an astronaut. Yay. <laughs> Me too. Maybe it happened. Maybe it happened. Um, oh, I know. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so Lily, um, any last words then as we close up tonight? Any other thing you want to? Um, it's really been great. Uh, uh, for, like what I do said, you want people to do as soon as they sign off of this? Um, go get involved in any citizen science project Sweet. because there is one out there for you. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> there really is. And go to SciStarter.com. There's a yep. lot of ways to get involved. Give them some feedback on their feedback. website. Give us feedback. Um, awesome. If you're a teacher or you know a teacher or you know someone who wants to be a teacher, um, have them try some things and send Lily some feedback. Um, all good stuff. So. Feedback from educators is key. Yeah. Yeah. Learn that at college. Yeah. So important. So yeah. important. Very great. Especially if you're a teacher who has tried a citizen science class or a citizen science project in the classroom, we want to hear from you. Excellent. You can even write a guest post for our blog. That'd be really great too. There you go. <laughs> guest blogging. Very good. Yeah. And Adley says, I'm not an educator, but I'll share these resources with educators and thank you. So, awesome. Yeah, so just spread the thank word. You. Good to hear. Okay, great. All right. Well I think that wraps us up for tonight. Nicole, glad you could make it. <laughs> the last minute. And <laughs> Yay, going. flight delays. I know. <laughs> so awesome to meet you too. Nicole, I'm yes, insane. I'll see you again. But yeah. I forgive you. <laughs> Hello, oh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Watch <laughs> the, the Converge sessions are all going to be streamed live, so you can check those out on the website. Oh, awesome. So great. it is together.scienceonline.com is where you can watch. Oh, great. Great. So you can see the big okay. sessions there. Awesome. Very all right, cool. excellent. All right. Okay, thanks, thanks everybody, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Have a good night. All right, good, good night. night. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.